Winnipeg is a place that a lot of people have never heard of. The world might not know Winnipeg, but Winnipeg knows the world. We do have that global outlook, but we're still a little bit of a secret. It's a unique place in the sense that we're right in the middle of the continent, but yet we seem to be so far away from everything else. We have such a great cultural scene. Our restaurants are second to none. We have amenities like the ballet, you know, the symphony, the opera. Um, we have world-class museums. The art is gritty, the music is gritty, or the streets are gritty. But in that, you know, there's a certain lack of pretension in Winnipeg. It is vibrant, full of life, and honestly, the people are as friendly as everybody says that they are. As Canada's sixth largest city, Winnipeg definitely punches above its weight. Known as the gateway to the West, Winnipeg has long been a trading center, even before the arrival of Europeans. Today, the city is not only the provincial capital, but also a hub for industry, business, and culture. And although it's located near the geographical heart of the nation, it is a city that often gets overlooked by Canadians. But not by me. While hearing and vision loss may change how I travel, it won't stop me from experiencing the people and culture that make this part of Canada so unique. I'm Alex Smythe, and this is Postcard from Winnipeg. Well, I moved here for love, really. I was living in Ontario. I fell in love with a man from Alberta, so we, we moved here. Debbie Patterson found that Winnipeg had surprising appeal, especially as someone working in the arts. I had visited here and noticed that actors were buying houses. This was in the 90s, and, and I thought, if there's a city where actors can buy houses, that's probably a good city to live in. Um, I wanted to be able to do my work without uh, having a side hustle that would take up all my time just to make rent. We met at Verde Juice Bar, a stylish cafe that specializes in fresh juices and smoothies in her neighborhood. The cafe is an example of the many ways the city can surprise visitors. Winnipeg doesn't give up its secrets easily, you know? There are, there are amazing, beautiful, wonderful things about Winnipeg that only Winnipeggers know. Certain times of the year, like during the Fringe or the Folk Festival, it's amazing. It's easy to find those secrets. It's easy to find, you know, the magic that this city has to offer. Since moving to Winnipeg, Debbie has become well-established in the theater community locally as well as nationally. But when she was diagnosed with MS, Debbie wasn't sure that she'd continue her career. When I became disabled, I didn't know how to do it because all the stories about disability are created by people without disabilities for people without disabilities. And I didn't want to be a tragedy or an inspiration. I just wanted to live my life, you know? And I didn't, there were no models, there were no stories that told me what that was like. And, and I feel like that's, it's that lack of, of that lived experience and that perspective in our media, in our storytelling, diminishes all of us, diminishes our idea of what it means to be human, diminishes our, our understanding of our own scope, our own resilience, our own uh, value as human beings in the world. We'll roll down and roll up so there's a lot more moving parts involved. In an effort to increase representation, Debbie founded Sick and Twisted Theatre, a company dedicated to creating work exploring the experience of living with a disability. Are the audiences receptive and, and excited to, to hear these new voices, these, these voices that haven't been given a platform to share. Audiences in Winnipeg are amazing. The audiences here take a big ownership of the arts community. They're proud of the, of the vibrant art scene in Winnipeg and they, and they feel like it's theirs. They know who the artists are. They know, you know, they, they, they care about, about Winnipeg created art art that reflects their lived experience in their world. Um, I, I created a, a depressing gas called Depressium. Debbie invited me to the first rehearsal of a new show. It's a cabaret, it's called the Useless Eaters Cabaret. So we've borrowed uh, terminology from uh, Nazi ideology for people with disabilities who are perceived as uh, consuming more than we produce. So we're, we're riffing on that and the, uh, the current state of the world where uh, um, those with compromised immune systems are, are cannon fodder in the, 
in the war against the, in this pandemic situation. We're, we're channeling our rage into wicked humor and uh, subversive content. Um, I tried to create a company that would pump out and distribute the right kind of depression, but uh, something went wrong. I think in Winnipeg the weather is really harsh and that creates a kind of uh, uh, interdependence among the people. You know, we really need each other and so we, we cultivate uh, a strong sense of community and a strong sense of interconnectedness in order to, in order to deal with the extremes. And that extends to the art scene as well, right? Absolutely. The many murals and public sculptures around Winnipeg are proof that this is a city that appreciates the arts. And the impressive Winnipeg Art Gallery is another. Founded in 1912, it was one of the first public art galleries in Canada. In 1972, it became the first to showcase contemporary First Nations art. And it continues to be a leader in that field today with the addition of a whole new wing. Tamiyuk is uh, the name of this part of our building, the new uh, Inuit Art Centre that is attached to the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, Kamiyuk is an Inuktitut word which means it is lit and we have, as you can see, windows um, instead of walls on this first level, so we get a lot of light in here. Curator Darlene White and I chatted in front of a giant visible glass vault. The three-story high S-shaped structure allows visitors to walk around and appreciate objects that would traditionally be kept in underground storage. For Darlene, this visible vault was a passion project. I designed this vault so that everything is organized by community and by artist. So uh, people can come, they can look at the shelf number and they can then go onto the touch screen, they can press that shelf and they get a photograph of everything on that shelf. And then if they want to see a particular object and see who the artist is, they just touch that particular carving and all the information comes up. We have our database online, um, we have digital programs online. So um, it really was a dream to make this collection more accessible to the world and to the North in particular. Can you tell me a bit about the, the goal of this art center? Why have so many pieces of modern Inuit art? Well, Winnipeg is actually sort of a center for access to the North. Um, uh, over many, many years. Um, and we were, we, the headquarters for the Hudson's Bay Company uh, was here. Uh, so a lot of um, uh, carvings were being sold in Winnipeg through the, uh, the, the, and the Guild of Crafts started selling in 1952. Uh, so a lot of collections were formed here. And uh, we, we started, the gallery started purchasing Inuit art for their collection in uh, like 1955. Uh, so we got in before a lot of other museums even thought it was worthwhile. Associate curator Jocelyn Perrainen appreciates the opportunity to share these works with the world. Some of these pieces have been around for, uh, you know, 50, even 60 years. Um, so it, we want to tell their stories, um, whether that be stone carvings, textiles, um, you know, parkas even, or, or mitts, a pair of mitts. These are stories that Darlene hopes visitors are happy to hear. Well, I hope that they understand what important work this is, for one thing. Um, aesthetically, um, this is world class. It's, it's, the art is absolutely superb. In terms of message and a legacy for this centre, what do you hope it is not only within the community, the Indigenous community here, but Winnipeg and then the region as a whole? Oh, I think that we will become a destination for people to travel here. I mean, it, it's unlike anything that exists in the world. So I, I really think that this is an important piece to that whole Northern story. After the break, we learn more about the story behind the city when we return to Postcards from Winnipeg. You're watching Postcards from Winnipeg. 
Exploring Winnipeg's historic exchange district, you can see the evidence of a once booming city. From the late 1800s to the early 1900s, Winnipeg was one of North America's fastest growing cities, helped along by the arrival of the railway, immigration, and record crop prices. Today, the Exchange District has one of the country's largest collections of buildings, warehouses, and hand-painted wall ads from the era, when Winnipeg was Canada's answer to Chicago and the third largest city in the country. That all changed with the opening of the Panama Canal, which shifted trade to Vancouver's ports and took the air out of Winnipeg's booming growth. A lot of uh, defining events in Canadian history happened right in this location. You know, from our entry into Confederation and the resistance, um, uh, the negotiation, um, half of the Métis, uh, treaty negotiations to, you know, um, all sorts of inventions coming out of Winnipeg. According to the Manitoba Museum's Anya Moody Foster, the early 1900s was an important time for Winnipeg and its impact on the national conversation community is struggling with some aspects about sort of, you know, who's in charge? What is what is our society going to be? What are our values? Um, and so there were both struggles and, um, you know, new things happening. So for example, uh, Winnipeg in well, actually Manitoba women were the first women to get the vote in Canada. The museum lets visitors explore Winnipeg during this significant era in an impressive full scale recreation of a city district, complete with immersive audio, and interactive elements. You literally get to go into it and walk through the buildings. Uh, you can go into a restaurant and a movie theater, a boarding house and all sorts of buildings. Anya shows me the non-such, another remarkable recreated scene within the museum. One that takes us to an earlier time. This is a full-scale replica of a ship that was built in 1650. Um, its claim to fame is that it was sort of the first ship to sail into Hudson's Bay, sort of on a fur trading voyage. I notice there's a lot of audio components, there's lighting components. What can you tell us about what we're hearing and what we're seeing here? We're meant to be in England right now, and so we're hearing, you know, voices with English accents, we're hearing music, we're hearing the kind of sounds you would um, have in a port. Um, but to me, the biggest thing is usually that you can smell the ship. Um, so we maintain the ship, you know, as, uh, as would be done traditionally. So what we're smelling is the tar of the ship. Um, so it really feels like you're being transported to a different place. Absolutely. And I did notice that the lights change, the, the sounds change on the ship every so often. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, and so that's just kind of a little bit of fun that we're having. Um, it's just to give an idea, sort of the day-night cycles. And there's a, a rainstorm that comes through. And you know, you have to imagine, you know, if you're sailing uh, on the Atlantic and a rainstorm comes along, you have to keep working. That ship is pretty big. How did it get in here and can it ever get out of here? <laughs> so that's probably the number one question we get. And um, so uh, the, the, actually the building was built around it. Um, so she's never leaving. Um, though we do kind of have to keep her in ship shape, you know, to keep the rigging all up. Um, and, uh, but she did sail for four summers before she came to the museum. Visitors can get their sea legs going and walk onto the ship to explore certain areas, including the captain's room. Anya, share some more details. So it's a double masted ketch and um, it has uh, mostly sort of square sails and the sails are all ready to sail. Um, there's also ropes going every, every which way and then there are sort of rope ladders that go up to the, um, up the mast. We call those ratlins. Um, and uh, there's two decks, uh, the poop deck at the back um, and there's just beautiful woodwork and carving all throughout the ship. Is the poop deck what I think it is? <laughs> no. Um, so poop just means it's the, the uppermost deck. Um, but we do really enjoy saying poop deck. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you. As a trading vessel, the ship served the Hudson's Bay Company well. Plying the waters of the bay the company was named after for many years. The museum also shares some of the perspective of the indigenous people who watched that ship sail to their shores. 
My favorite thing is uh, uh, a story told by Louis Bird. So we have a recording of him telling the story that was passed down by generations for generations um, by the Cree community of Wiscaganish in Quebec um, and uh, telling the story of their first encounter with Europeans and what they called the Ship of, uh, of Clouds. And um, so it gives a, a different perspective on the welcome that these sailors received um, and the help that they got from the local Indigenous people when they arrived. The museum also covers life pre-European contact through archaeological research. I'm the curator of archaeology and so I'm looking into sort of the deep past and predominantly in Manitoba that's Indigenous uh, history. Uh, my background, I'm, I'm Cree from uh, and a member of Norway House, so northern Manitoba. Kevin Brownlee shares how the research of an ancient bison hunting area inspired the prairie gallery we were in. We've got uh, a wall uh, sort of dedicated to this that shows an eroding riverbank uh, and the bison bones that are falling out from it uh, to represent this site that was really important to First Nation peoples as they were communal bison hunting, providing food security uh, 1,100 years ago. Can you talk a bit about the Indigenous representation, the perspective that's being displayed as part of this museum and this exhibit? Yeah, well, and throughout the, the gallery, we've been so fortunate to be able to work with um, First Nation communities and help sort of uh, let them tell their story. And I think one of the great examples that we have, and actually it, it predates this uh, latest one, is the teepee that we're sitting beside. Uh, this is the Hall family teepee, and it was the teepee that was gifted to the Manitoba Museum when we were redoing this space. This is one piece that we said has to come back in here. Expertise and knowledge from the local Indigenous peoples proved invaluable for early settlers, especially surviving the harsh winters. Winters were tough, winters were long. The day's work was to improve your shelter, to um, you know, build your home to take care of your livestock, to work on the farm so that you can feed yourself. I continue my history lesson at Lower Fort Gary National Historic Site, which aims to take visitors back into the past to get a better sense of what life was like for early settlers. According to Interpretation Coordinator Matthew Rothenberger, the site holds historic significance on several fronts. It is the first training ground of the Northwest Mounted Police, who eventually became what we know as, as the RCMP. Um, it's Manitoba's first penitentiary. It was Manitoba's first asylum or mental health facility. Um, it was also a uh, you know, major hub of trade for the Hudson Bay Company. And then most importantly, it is the place of the signing of Treaty Number no. 1. And what can you tell me about that signing? So the signing was uh, August 3rd of uh, 1871. And, uh, you know, uh, approximately a thousand indigenous peoples from the area um, came and gathered here at Lower Fort Gary to, to discuss for the first time um, signing an agreement with the newly formed country of Canada, hence Treaty Number 1. To fully understand, you know, how we got to the place we are, we really need to look back at, um, you know, the relationship of uh, Indigenous peoples in the area with those initial settlers, with the Canadian government initially, um, to gain a better understanding of, of how we can repair those, those bridges and, and build a brighter future together. Matthew and I spoke in the bakehouse, which specialized in a couple staple items, including bannock, a simple, unleavened oval-shaped bread, popular with both settlers and indigenous peoples. I won't lie, the smell of baked goods piqued my interest, and interpreter Siri Mori agreed to help me make my own bannock and butter, which sounded like a winning combination. First up is all of our dry ingredients. So we are going to start with our flour. Sure. We need a cup and a half. Next, we do have our baking powder. Okay. Um, so we will be needing uh, three quarters of a cup of this. Perfect. So this is a quarter teaspoon, okay. teaspoon I should say. So three of these. Three of those, yes. And then finally, our salt. So again, that'll be about a quarter of a teaspoon of okay. salt for that. Next, we are going to mix those dry ingredients, Perfect. if you'd like. We've got a spoon for you okay. there. I, I was ready to get my hands dirty, but a spoon, <laughs> I guess, is spoon more Spoon we can water. start with, and then we'll use our hands in a little bit. Okay. For our wet ingredients, we do have two. So we do have a fat <laughs> and some water. So for our fat today, we are going to be using some melted butter, if you'd Perfect. like to pour that on in. And then finally, we do have our water here. So we are going to use about three quarters cup. So you can pour that on in. 
and we will do a preliminary stir with um, the spoon, okay. but then we can get our hands dirty to mix it all up and get it into a nice dough. After mixing the dough to the right consistency, I rolled it out using a rolling pin into, eh, let's just say, a roughly oval-shaped object. Next, getting the dough into the baking pan. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's an Alex special right there. <laughs> it's not the prettiest, but I'm sure it's gonna fill oh, me up. just as great. And with that, the dough was sent into the oven to bake, while Siri and I made some butter. Typically, we would actually be using a butter churn, but that takes hours. Yep. So instead, we are going to use a mason jar full of cream that you can just okay. shake, and it'll be butter. So there's all the buttermilk that came out. Yep. Then there's our clump of butter. Oh, cool. We got the butter. Yes. But what about the bannock? Well, the bannock is just ready to come on out, so I'll go grab that now. Perfect. Here's our little bannock. It did get a bit toasted. Okay. But that just means it's nice and cooked through. Exactly. And you know what? I'm not going to complain. <laughs> it looked delicious. It's hot and warm on a mm -hmm. cool day like today. It's perfect. I'm ready to dive in. Yes. So I will just take it out and put it onto a nice plate. Perfect. And let me know how it tastes. This is really good. Sorry to talk with my mouth full, <laughs> but mm, cooked well. Mm -hmm. Not a non ton of flavor, you know, yeah. it's a very simple recipe, but with a bit of that homemade, fresh made butter. Mm -hmm. From eating like a settler to dining in a modern bistro, we get into some local comfort food when we return to Postcards from Winnipeg. Welcome back to Postcards from Winnipeg. Flat, that's one word to describe Winnipeg and its surrounding region. It's a natural consequence of being located at the bottom of the Red River Valley in a floodplain, bordering tall grass prairies on its west and aspen parkland on its east. With long winters and short hot summers, cultivating sustained agriculture isn't easy, and neither is opening a restaurant focused on ingredients sourced from this region. But that's exactly what Chef Dean Herbert aimed to do when he launched Bistro on Notre Dame. So we use bison as much as we can as opposed to beef. Rather than use seafood, we use freshwater fish from Manitoba. So for me, the environmental impact means a lot. One of the mantras I say, source local, and if you can't, source responsibly and ethically after that. Is that something that is uh, found in the greater Winnipeg scene as well, that there's, there's more attention being paid to where the food is being sourced from. I always kind of joke that Winnipeg is 10 years behind whatever the West Coast does. Our infrastructure for local is a lot better than it was, say, even five years ago. There's a lot more you can do through farmer's markets. Like I said, the bison rancher I use is gate to plate. So in Winnipeg, it is starting to come around now, yes. Even the Bistro's furniture and decor leans local using reclaimed materials from old barns, which radiates a nice warm and cozy feeling. But seriously, I was here for the food, so it was time to get down to business and try Dean's twist on a Southern classic, Manitoba biscuits and gravy. I felt we could put a Manitoba stamp on it by using Bannock instead, a uh, better option than buttermilk biscuits, and let's add some bison to it. So we toast the Bannock, we start with onions and our chorizo. Um, when it's ready, we add our bacon, gravy, and bison, and that's the dish. I, I'm done talking. I'm, I'm gonna dig in. I hope you don't mind. Mmm. Mmm. Oh my goodness. Talk about flavor. The, the gravy is so rich. You get the bison, you get the chorizo, you get the onion. The bacon come through, and the bannock, it's just sitting there soaking up that gravy so you get that extra punch of it. I, I think, great call on the bannock because I think that adds a bit more of a lighter, uh, fluffier uh, a base for it. This is home style at its finest. You know, this is local, this is fresh. A new twist on an American classic. I just need to eat more. I, I, I just can't let this go. It was traveling comfort food at its best. Familiar, yet unique. A promise that Bistro Notre Dame delivers. 
I really felt like I was enjoying food from this region and its environment. It's an ecosystem that I wanted to explore and know better. Fortunately, the city is blessed with a large reclaimed urban green space called Fort White Alive, which, as Barrett Miller explains, aims to educate and connect people with nature. We believe that the more people play and learn outside, the more that generates care and concern for the environment that benefits both the local ecosystem and everybody globally. Now we're standing on a deck in front of a beautiful lake. There's geese and other uh, birds flying around and creating noise. Can you t what can you tell me about this uh, backdrop we're standing in front of? So this lake was actually dug out by the concrete industry in the first half of the 20th century. And it was actually folks who were involved with that mining operation, with creating the scars on the landscape, who decided that it would be a good idea to protect and bring back some green area. So from what looked kind of like the surface of the moon, very gray and dusty and cold, to a thriving lake ecosystem. It's amazing what can happen when we work with nature instead of fight against it. Barrett took me on a habitat secret tour, a stroll along nature trails with stops to point out items of interest, like a magpie nest camouflage amongst the bare, leafless trees. It's sticks, maybe about the size of a drinking straw, woven together, but not just woven together to make a cup like we think of most conventional nests. It actually has a handle, it has a roof. It looks kind of like a picnic basket, only with a more substantial handle. That is to provide shelter, shade, and uh, well, shelter from the rain for a magpie family. Okay. Magpies, their body is about the size of a robin, but their tail is about as long as their body. As we came around the corner, there was a magpie that flew out of it. So she is out there probably gathering nesting material right now. We also stopped to relax next to a pond teeming with life. Well, this pond is a, it's a good example of a prairie pothole uh, wetland. It's not just full of water though, all the cattails and the willows. In the background, I can hear peep, peep, peep. The frogs are just loving this. So no, you can appreciate life at whatever scale that you want to in a place like this. Barrett wasn't kidding about scale. Fort White Alive features a herd of resident bison who roam across their own dedicated prairie grassland. And if you weren't sure about the size of bison, Barrett has a handy visual aid that helps. Barrett, we have a large pole between us. What can you tell me about this? This is our bison pole, the large white and green striped pole helps us illustrate just how large the bison is. They are the ninth largest land animal in the world and the biggest that's wild in North or South America. The lowest marker that's about the height of my hip, maybe about a meter off the ground, that's the height of a bison calf at the shoulder at about three weeks to a month old. When they're born, they're a little bit smaller, maybe the size of a large dog. Average height of a deer in Manitoba is exactly a meter off the ground. That's at the, about my navel, range, that's at the shoulder. The average female bison is about five and a half feet, maybe almost one and a half, one and three quarter meters tall at the shoulder. Now she weighs between 800 and 1,000 pounds. That would be about, oh, about 250 to 400 kilos. The average bull at the shoulder, quite a bit taller than I am, and they clock in, that could be a thousand kilogram animal. The record, is about three meters tall. And the funny thing about that, that's how high they can jump. They can go three meters straight up when properly motivated. They can go 10 meters straight forward when they really want to in one bound. Whoa, well, let's just say I was happy to watch this herd from a distance. But Barrett showed me one that I could safely pet, a stuffed bison in the interpretive building one of the few animals that visitors can explore up close and indoors. But my education wasn't yet complete, as I still wanted to learn more about these impressive creatures. Fortunately, another herd was close by at the Assiniboine Zoo. They kind of look like a big shaggy cow. Program instructor Elsie Hampshire paints me a picture. They've got a huge hump on their neck, which is just chock full of muscle. They're really, really, really furry, which helps protect them against insects. So they got a lot of fur on their front half and their back half is actually almost naked. So they look like they're wearing sweaters, which is pretty funny. According to Director of Communications, Laura Sabak, the zoo actively decided to focus on reflecting the region. A lot of time and energy was invested 
into creating an experience that is uniquely Manitoban. So we designed this wonderful new attraction and exhibit called Journey to Churchill, which really highlights Manitoba's amazing northern wildlife. In addition, we also have species from the southern part of our province. So everything from bison to elk to lynx to the amazing polar bears that are here in Manitoba in the north and other species. And those are experiences that you just can't get anywhere else. Wait, did I hear polar bears? I asked Elsie to fill me in. Polar bears are magnificent creatures. They are the largest of the bears. They have a lot of personality. They love to swim. They love to play with each other. So they like to spar. They are the most carnivorous of all the bears. Most bears actually eat more plant material than they do meat. Polar bears are the exception. And they also love things like lettuce. Lettuce is one of their favorite foods. Marshmallows is one of their other favorite treats. You can get a polar bear over to you in under two minutes if you are holding a marshmallow in your hand. <laughs> I don't think I want a polar bear near me, but the, I guess that's good to know in case I ever change my mind or feeling uh, like I want to live a bit dangerously then. Coming up, a prairie beach town? We'll explore Gimli and its Icelandic roots on postcards from Winnipeg. You're watching Postcards from Winnipeg. It's spring in the region north of Winnipeg, and this has been a rainy one, with many lakes springing up in normally dry fields. Amongst some of these fields is one very unique location, where fissures in the bedrock have created ideal conditions for garter snakes. The Narcissi snake dens attract many visitors and have dens along the trails where you can look for snakes. And although the snakes were out in low numbers, I still got to hold one in my hands. Proof that the prairies around here have some surprises. Surprises like the 11th largest freshwater lake in the world. Lake Winnipeg is actually where the city got its name, from the Cree Win Nippi. Small lakeside towns dot this region, including one that will definitely catch your eye. Whether it's a seawall mural, fighter jet monument, or the Viking statue, the town of Gimli is definitely worth the visit. Wait. Viking statue? If nothing else, it's a great photo op. Not that there was any specific Vikings landing on the shores here, but anyway, it's one of our, you know, myths. <laughs> Elva Simonson is a volunteer with the New Iceland Heritage Museum in Gimli and explains how a group of settlers from Iceland ended up founding this town. They could see grass and they could see water. So you could feed your animals and fish. And the government of Canada set aside a very specific piece of property here for this, this Icelandic group. So it is a, a unique piece of history. And so the New Iceland Heritage Museum was created by a community group to focus on that story and to preserve that story. The museum documents the evolution of New Iceland into Gimli. Because it's a unique fishing community, it's, it's a unique historical community, and it's, it, and it's a great tourist destination. Is it true that if you come and visit here, uh, I don't know, maybe you might be able to dress up like a Viking, and if that's the case, could yours truly give it a try? You could give it a try. You've got the right look, you've got the right beard, fortunately. Good thing you didn't shave this month. <laughs> <laughs> I donned the jacket, the helmet, shield, and axe. And I know I struck fear in the hearts of all those around me. But one thing a warrior needs is food, and carrying around the extra pounds of armor really builds an appetite. Fortunately, I'd heard of a bakery that served a dessert created specifically by New Icelanders. In the name of research, this I had to try. Well, I hope they're gonna smell Grandma's kitchen with lots of uh, sugar and butter and uh, lots of butter tarts. Michelle Weirda is the owner of Sugar Me Cookie Boutique and is known as the Butter Tart Lady. And although I love butter tarts, it was a treat that dated back to the new Icelandic settlers that I was really interested in. So that's called the Vina Tarta, which is a seven layer cookie layer with, we hand grind our prunes and put them in, and then we top it with a cardamom buttercream. And it has to have seven layers to be traditional. I had to try one out, for research, of course. So I bit into the Vina Tarta that Michelle handed me. 
the soft cookie layers yielded to layers of ground dates below. Not too sweet and with a hint of cardamom. This alone was worth the journey to Gimli. Now I just need to figure out how I'm going to smuggle some home. To share, of course. After the break, we'll delve into Manitoba's Métis past, the resistance, and the legacy of human rights. When we return to Postcards from Winnipeg. Welcome back to Postcards from Winnipeg. Cities are often defined by their geography, and in that, Winnipeg is no different. The Red and Assiniboine Rivers carve their way through the city, and where they meet is a very special place. The French called it La Fourche, the English, the Forks. But for over 6,000 years, the local indigenous peoples called it a meeting place, where goods were brought and traded. That tradition continued with European fur traders until the railways moved in and established the area as their hub. The railway buildings are still there today, but the forks has reverted back to its roots as a meeting place, a historic site with markets, green space, and public art. In the early days, the area was also a dividing line between the French and English settlements that would one day become Winnipeg. That French and Métis community still exists today, and the St. Boniface Museum, housed in a former nun's convent, makes sure their history isn't forgotten. The museum itself is actually the oldest building in Winnipeg. Brielle Fontaine is a museum interpreter. I really appreciate, honestly, the, the structure of the museum. It, it's over 800 sort of, of these oak logs that they hand hewn. Like you can still see, you know, marks on the walls of people's tools, which is um, really amazing just how, how the history lives in the building itself. It's history that sort of wasn't always valued and because of that, wasn't always preserved in a way that uh, other histories were. What Riel is referring to is the attitude of English Canada towards the Métis and French at the time. After all, the province of Manitoba was born out of the Métis-led Red River resistance, headed by Louis Riel, which won assurances that the Métis land and cultural rights would be protected within Canada. We ventured outside to walk through a garden that details Métis history and culture with plaques and installations. This garden was sort of installed uh, in uh, 2018 by two Métis artists. The path in sort of an S shape through the garden is actually um, made with sort of these bricks in two different colors. Um, on one side, the bricks are a little bit paler um, and on the other side, they're more of, a, more of a red sort of darker color and it mixes together in the middle and that represents the blending of the two cultures um, that the Métis were born from, essentially. Near the garden is the Cathedral de Saint Boniface and cemetery where Louis Riel is buried. Interpreter Raphael Boutois tells me more. It's very important for the Métis because this was the first and still is the largest uh, cemetery in terms of Métis presence in the West. Uh, a lot of it was lost in 1860. Uh, the cathedral that we're standing in front of is actually the third of, um, of the cathedrals that has been built here. The first one uh, burnt in fire, 1860, and during that fire, uh, all of the parish records for the area were lost. Uh, and because of that, all the marriages, uh, the death records, the baptisms here, it's all been lost. So it's hard for Métis people today to retrace their history. The Métis struggle to assert their rights seems to be imprinted in the DNA of this city. And the building across the river from St. Boniface strives to be a shining beacon towards that end. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights is truly one of a kind. Built to appear as a craggy limestone mountain, wrapped in windows that form the wings of a dove and topped with an icy peak. The museum works with shapes and light to embody the diversity of the human experience. Inside, walls slope at unusual angles and visitors can use alabaster ramps to crisscross the building to access different floors and exhibits. It's a particular privilege to have the museum in Winnipeg, which has been the site of so many important human rights stories from immigration, to labor, to indigenous rights, to women's rights. And today, you know, we find this city to be the locus of so much human rights activism, particularly from the indigenous community who represent a really important and significant part of our, of our population here in Winnipeg. 
According to Rory McLeod, the museum hopes to take guests on a journey of understanding and contemplation. We start with some foundational concepts. What are human rights? What are some indigenous perspectives on human rights that are woven throughout every gallery in the museum? What are some of our Canadian stories? And then we go up through the museum. And as you go up, you'll notice that you're going on a journey from darkness to light. You'll notice more and more natural light pulling through. And you'll also notice that the stories will transform over time from being some of our darker moments in human history to profiling human rights champions who've changed the world for the better. We hope that when visitors come to the museum, they'll absolutely learn something new uh, or maybe look at an issue in a way that they hadn't before because they've been able to make this personal connection with these human rights defenders who took action for a better future. And we also hope that they'll realize that they too have the capacity to be human rights champions. They too can take action in their lives for a better future. Curator Travis Tomchuk tells me about an exhibit that focuses on the Canadian disability experience. It tells a number of different stories. Again, it's not like this gallery itself. It's not a complete story of like disability rights in Canada, but it shows different aspects of that history, you know, whether it's, um, you know, women that were institutionalized in like the early nine, you know, 1900s. Also things like, you know, kind of like intelligent testing and what the outcomes that would be for children if they, if they happen to do not very well on, on such a test. Um, and each one of these 13 components, the story begins with a particular artifact. So the artifact is used as a jumping off point. The exhibits are full of technology and interactive displays. Though a visual feast, Rory says that the museum takes inclusion to heart. One of the things you'll notice when you come to the museum is that there are no curbs, no barriers anywhere. There won't be any, any impediment for someone for, who's using a wheelchair from exploring all parts of the museum alongside everybody else. Everywhere you see a railing in the museum, there's actually two heights of railings because we want to be aware of folks who are using different mobility devices and how they might need to interact with railings differently. And we also want to be there for kids and folks to, to make sure that they can experience the museum in a good way. We incorporate uh, American Sign Language and Langsin de Quebec in all our video products. We use described audio everywhere throughout the museum. We have Braille on all our signage, uh, as well as on all the touch points that are, that are instructive in terms of how you visit the museum. We use universal access points as well as universal keypads to let people dive into digital content. Um, and then we also look at accessibility from the perspective of gender. And so we've recently made all our washrooms at the museum gender inclusive. What do you hope that guests take away and, and move forward when they leave here? Well, first and foremost, I hope that guests who arrive here at the museum, if they come from communities that have experienced significant and substantial violations of their human rights, first and foremost, I hope that they feel recognized. I also hope that visitors, particularly young visitors, but really visitors of all ages, come here and learn and get inspired to take action. You know, we, we want people to discover, we want people to reflect, we want people to grow. But most of all, I want people to finish their journey in the Tower of Hope and think, you know, what is it that I can do today, tomorrow, for the rest of my life to be a change maker in my community? And that's exactly what I did. From up in the tower, the city and prairie seemed to go on and on. But you could also see what made this region so special. Waterways meeting, people coming together, the exchange of goods and ideas and a legacy born out of struggle, but working towards hope. The weather may be tough, but the people are very friendly. And although Winnipegers may be humble, their city is full of surprises. You just have to come out here and explore it for yourself. Host, Alex Smythe. Producer and director, Emma Tandon. Videographer and editor, Sergio Vera Barahona. Media Accessibility Specialist, Ron Rickford. Audio Post, Mark Phoenix. Graphics, Mike Smith. Senior Producer, Michelle Dudas. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2022, Accessible Media Inc.